Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear us well. So we will run you through a short presentation with an update of um, our portfolio and market, and also um, timeline towards uh, maturity of the funds. Um, we had a similar call with our fund three investor, and um, it has received positive feedback. So we decided to do the same here again. Quickly on the agenda, we will run you through a quick market update of what happened since the portfolios have launched. Thereafter, we will dive into selected assets of our portfolio. There are a number of major milestones happening this year, and we would like to dive into that. Um, we will speak about trading infrastructure and how it changed over the last two years. Um, and last but not least, we will speak about fund maturity of fund one and two, path to liquidation of those funds as they approach um, their end of the term. So, as you know, fund um, fund one and fund two have been pretty early on in, in the um, basically ecosystem of uh, cryptocurrency investments. Fund one, actually the first external capital we took on in October 2016. That was pre-official launch. Official launch was in, was in March 2016. We then launched fund two in September. 2017 and if you look back really what's happened over the last couple of years 2016 and 17 we have seen this massive bull run an explosion in crypto valuations and we've seen this massive ico boom we have thereafter seen a um, a bear market that lasted for almost two years um, 2018 and 19 thereafter we have seen a period of consolidation for the better part of basically for the past year and we are now seeing an uptick and um, and like as we believe in entering into the next the bull market and what's interesting here is we have looked at other new disruptive technologies and how they first started for example when the internet first started or the telephone even as far back as electricity or the steam engine there have been always these boom and bust cycles and they came through investors getting excited about entering that space um, there have been uh, investments flowing into that area and at some point investors realized in all of those disruptive technologies that um, that in, in this innovation will take more time than initially hoped for it came a period of disappointment and mark and prices collapsed but what all of those boom and bust cycles had in common was that the period these bu initial bull markets have resulted in a lot of capital entering the space and this capital um, venture capital typically and risk capital is now financing innovation and what's happening behind the curtain and behind the daily noise was actually that um, a number of um, very high profile blockchain projects have emerged the quality of people in the area and in the space have substantially emerged if we look at projects where we invested um, like a year ago things like solana Solana's CEO was formerly head of compression at Dropbox and he worked at Qualcomm and has a deep technical background. Whereas three years ago, uh, the average kind of crypto um, yeah, founder was a mid 20 year old um, university breakout. So a dropout. So, so this has changed. The quality of people have changed. We are seeing more institutional adoption entering. And it's interesting, if we look back a little bit at this chart here in 2013 and 14, mm. we have seen actually a first big boom in about 1,000 US dollar. Thereafter, it crashed down back basically to around $170. And uh, people were dev devastated and thought the crypto market is dead. It followed a, a few years of more or less stability. And we have now seen the same boom and bust cycle in 2017 and 18. And in, but if you look back from today's perspective, the 2013 and 14 boom and bust cycle merely looks like a little blip in history. And we believe similarly, if we look five years into the future, the 2017 and 18 boom and bust cycle will look like a little, little blip in history. And we can already see that happening. If you look at the volumes, the gray area at the bottom of the chart, specifically in July 2019 and 20, the volumes have picked up substantially and by far are surpassing the previous all-time volume highs when um, in 2018. Yeah. 
Um, so, so now to kind of talk a bit about what's happened this year, and, and specifically here we have the, the price of Bitcoin. Um, and it's been a pretty eventful year, and I think there are, there are a few key events that are worth highlighting and talking about. Um, so firstly, in, in kind of mid-March, on the 13th of March, we had this very significant collapse in the price of Bitcoin, uh, which I've marked here as the, the COVID collapse. Um, you know, and this was really the day when all the stock markets fell um, and, and all kind of asset, all asset classes fell and really nothing was, um, I guess, uh, free from, from a liquidity crunch. Um, and, you know, specifically in, in the case of digital assets, uh, you know, the market capitalization of the whole space fell by 52%. Uh, Bitcoin fell from, I think, 9,130 down to about 4,000 US dollars. Uh, and Ether fell from 246 down to 89 US dollars. Um, so it was, you know, really significant. And in terms of the volumes on that day, um, Bitcoin had a, a trading volume of $76 billion, which is about five times normal, um, the, the normal trading rate. You know, and so, so, you know, thinking about this, there are a few reasons for this. You know, firstly, obviously, this was to do with um, everything, the, the events going on in the world and, and, and everything surrounding COVID. Um, and, and really, investors were selling anything that was liquid. But I think more interestingly is we saw some kind of structural inefficiencies here, particularly with Bitcoin, um, which was that there were a, an historic number of leveraged long positions that were placed on Bitcoin before this collapse happened. Um, and, and in part, that was because people were anticipating the Bitcoin halving, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but because of all these longs, you know, as the Bitcoin price fell, you know, it fell quite suddenly, um, it triggered liquidations, which then pushed the price of Bitcoin down further, triggering more liquidations. And it was this kind of cascade. And one of the reasons for that is Bitcoin has a thing called the block time, which is 10 minutes long. And, and that's the time it takes you know, for, for a block to be confirmed. So there were investors who wanted to basically increase their margin on trading platforms on the 13th, but the price of Bitcoin was falling so fast that they didn't have time to do that before they were liquidated. So that was kind of you know, an interesting event that we kind of learned a fair bit from there. Um, we then had the Bitcoin halving, which took place um, in, the, in early May. Uh, and and you, as you can see here, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin really kind of recovered significantly going into the halving. Um, just as a reminder for you, uh, the Bitcoin halving is where the supply of Bitcoin that is issued uh, to miners is cut in half. This happens every four years um, as part of the, the supply schedule of Bitcoin. Um, and so, and, and this is kind of historically seen as a very bullish event. Um, and it's seen as a bullish event uh, mainly, you know, so historically, so the first time a halving took place, uh, the price of Bitcoin rallied 79 times in the following year. Uh, the second time a halving took place, the price of Bitcoin rallied 30 times over an 18-month period after the halving. So historically, this has been a very you know, positive case. And, and the rationale for that is that Bitcoin miners are generally net sellers of Bitcoin. You know, these are, um, you know, these entities, uh, you know, they have large operating expenses. So they're you know, paying for electricity, they're paying for rent, they're paying for labor, they're paying for new machines. And, and in order to cover those costs, you know, in return, they're earning Bitcoin. So they're continually selling some of their Bitcoin to cover their operating expenses. So at a halving, basically what you're saying is, is every, every block that's created, there's half as much Bitcoin now being given to miners. So they have, you know, half as much Bitcoin to, to spend to cover their costs. So it's basically selling pressure in the market reduces. Um, also in line with that is, is the fact that, um, that the Bitcoin miners you know, have a pretty significant um, sway over the price of Bitcoin. You know, these markets are still not you know, fully efficient. And so the Bitcoin miners know that they need the price of Bitcoin to go up significantly um, in order for them to continue running their operations. So a lot of them start hoarding Bitcoin, particularly around the halving, and try to stop selling Bitcoin in order to kind of try and help the price um, appreciate. Um, one kind of interesting thing to note is that this Bitcoin halving actually took place uh, during the rainy season in China, which has kind of actually saved a lot of miners' skin because the electricity prices during the rainy season go down significantly because of a lot of the hydroelectric power in China. Um, so, um, so that was kind of an interesting fact. Um, so we, we then had kind of a, a month or two where Bitcoin was range bound. So you can see this period in blue, um, kind of between nine and 10,000. Um, and this was kind of almost remarkably stable for, for Bitcoin. 
Uh, and it was interesting. We had our, our fund three call about a month ago and we were kind of about, you know, here. Um, and we were saying at the time that, that we were, we were pretty confident we were going to see the price break out on the upside because every time we saw Bitcoin drop to about 9,000, there was a lot of buying pressure pushing it back up. So it was clear there was a very, very strong floor there. Um, and then really, you know, in the early um, August, we saw this, this kind of pretty big break on the upside where Bitcoin you know, rocketed straight through the 10,000s into the 11,000s, and it's been hovering at around 12,000 for the last couple of weeks. Uh, it broke above 12,000 a few days ago. Um, and so you know, 12,000 is acting as a bit of resistance right now. But, but if you go beyond that, and when Bitcoin does break beyond that, there's really quite a lot of clear space until about 15,000 US dollars. And then above that, you're looking at all times, you know, the all time high of Bitcoin was 20,000. And beyond that, you know, people are talking about Bitcoin hitting 50,000 or even 100,000 in the next kind of year or two. Um, yeah, so we are currently seeing three narratives playing out that are bullish for Bitcoin in the broader ecosystem. Firstly, Bitcoin is perceived more and more as a real asset. I mean, big institutions are getting into the space. Um, then specifically with the global, actually the current Corona crisis is helping Bitcoin to, to a large extent, given the quantitative easing that's happening and how central banks and governments are printing more and more money to kind of support the economies, thereby in our view, artificially pumping up asset prices um, or on the flip side, devaluing the US dollar. And uh, so Bitcoin as a true decent, truly decentralized assets, um, being scarce, only run by code and by math, not governed by any government or central banks. Um, and in, with its built in into the algorithm inherently um, um, quantitative tightening, which is interesting. As Charlie just mentioned, the Bitcoin halving that takes every four years place actually reduces the additional, additionally issued Bitcoin as opposed to the US which is actually just increasing. Perceived more and more as a real asset is perceived as a hedge against a global declining economy. And Bitcoin is therefore oftentimes perceived as an emerging digital next generation version of gold. So we see this quantitative easing taking place. We also see more and more institutional, big institutional capital entering the space. So Paul Tudor Jones, for example, who is an American hedge fund legend, he manages 20 billion US dollars and he's one of the most respected people on, on, on Wall Street. Um, he was just recently, I think half a year ago, roughly issuing a big report of um, why they have started to deploy capital into Bitcoin. And he, he basically, I'd like to quote him by, by, by saying, we are witnessing the great monetary inflation an unprecedented expansion of every form of money, unlike anything the development developed world has ever seen. This is a pretty bold statement and uh, we couldn't agree more. Uh, there have been other big institutional investors entering the space, so Jim Simmons's $75 billion Renaissance Technology flagship fund um, has entered uh, Bitcoin trading, or Bit in this case, Bitcoin futures trading. And, and this really opens basically the door for a number of other big hedge fund managers. Then, Fidelity, for example, invested into our OTC broker and custodian BC Group, which is a big milestone for BC Group, but also I, I think for the ecosystem here in Hong Kong. Temasek, one of the largest global institutional investors with over 300 billion US dollar uh, worth of assets under management, has a, started a dedicated blockchain team. So we can really see this narrative playing out with Bitcoin being more and more perceived as a real asset. And Charlie, do you want to jump in on yeah. the grassroots adoption? Yeah, so, so also, you know, in terms of grassroots adoption, I think there are kind of three things that we're seeing. You know, firstly, from a kind of uh, an analytical perspective, we can see that wallet, you know, the, the, there's a 70% growth rate in um, Bitcoin wallets. Um, and today, you know, there are only 30 million Bitcoin wallets with a non-zero Bitcoin balance and only 3 million wallets with more than kind of 0.1 Bitcoin, which is about a thousand US dollars. But you know that this growth rate of 70% a year is is very encouraging. Um, secondly, kind of anecdotally, we're just seeing more and more um, kind of mainly retail focused um, companies uh, enabling clients to access Bitcoin. Whether this is something like kind of a PayPal or a Square, or, or in North America, there's a thing called Wealth Simple, which is you know a, a 
an easy way for, in, for retail investors to invest in the stock markets, they're now including things like Bitcoin and Ether um, into their service. Um, and then thirdly, you know, from a philosophical perspective, it just feels that you know, there's you know, civilian unrest in places like Hong Kong you know, in the, and in the US um, and, and a, lot, a lot of the Western world. Um, you know, people are looking at what's happening you know, with things like money printing, as Martin has spoken about, and are looking at whether there is kind of another way um, to, to, to run the financial system. And that a lot of people are kind of getting attracted to the decentralized nature of Bitcoin, the fact that it can't be influenced by governments. Um, you know, and, and I guess you know, going back to the very first block that was ever created um, in Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the creator of Bitcoin, wrote in that first block for the British government was bailing out British banks for 50 billion pounds. Um, you know, and this was obviously in 2009. Well, today, uh, $50 billion is being printed by the US every four days. So, you know, it's a really remarkable, um, you know, I, I can only imagine how Satoshi would feel about that, assuming he's still around today. So, you know, Bitcoin was really created with this philosophy to, to, to kind of change the power structures around money. Um, and I think it's time is really coming. Um, so now we're going to jump into talking about some of the, the assets in our portfolios. Uh, you know where they are today, how they're doing, and then and then what we see kind of coming up in the, in the near future. Um, you know, so two of two of our kind of more important assets, uh, or particularly the kind of larger assets in the ecosystem, are Ethereum and Cosmos. Uh, and both of these projects have big upgrades that are on the horizon. And so, starting with Ethereum, um, many of you will know about Ethereum. It's the leading smart contract platform in the world. Um, you know, there has thousands of, of applications running on top of it. And you can think of it a bit like an Apple App Store. This, it's a platform where people can deploy applications on top of it. And we've really started to see the first breakout use case uh, of Ethereum over the last, probably uh, the last kind of six months or so, which is a thing called DeFi, decentralized finance. Um, and this is where you know, people in Ethereum are really recreating the financial system, but in a decentralized manner with decentralized lending and borrowing. And, and all sorts of things. And, and in particular, the amount of collateral locked up in DeFi is growing at a staggering rate. Um, so it's funny, so, so today, uh, $6.8 billion is locked up in DeFi. One month ago when we did this presentation, it was 2.6 billion. So it's literally, it, it's, it's basically doubling every month, the amount of collateral. Um, and if, and you know, there's, if you think ahead, you know, if that growth rate continues, and I, I think it could well do, um, for the remainder of the year, um, you know, right now only about one to two percent of all digital assets are locked up as collateral in in DeFi contracts. You know, I think that could easily get to ten percent. So you know, we're talking you know, easily you know, getting to kind of forty or fifty billion dollars locked up. And the benefit of that for Ethereum is is every time a transaction takes place on Ethereum, a small amount of Ether is required for that transaction to happen. So as more and more people are using DeFi and using Ethereum there's more demand for Ether in order to, to run these applications. So that demand in theory should, should push up the price of Ethereum um, or, or of Ether. Um, now that's one of the, the big kind of challenges that Ethereum is facing is, is around scalability. So because of all this usage that's happening, we're seeing that the network get a bit congested and the fees on the network are getting pretty high. Um, and, and today there are some solutions to that, in particular kind of layer two scaling solutions. But looking ahead, um, there's a really big upgrade coming called ETH2 or Ethereum 2.0. Uh, this, and this has kind of two big parts to it. The first is it's changing um, Ethereum's, Ethereum's consensus mechanism. So it's upgrading from a thing called proof of work to a thing called proof of stake. Um, so proof of work is what Bitcoin uses and what Ethereum currently uses. And it's, it's, very, um, it, it's pretty slow. It, it requires a lot of processing power and a lot of electricity, whereas proof of stake is this kind of newer system much more energy efficient and, and, and a faster system. The other big upgrade in Ethereum 2.0 is this scaling upgrade called sharding. So sharding is basically where you, you have a single network and you split it into multiple shards and each shard can run its own set of transactions, um, but they can all, all the shards can communicate with each other. And um, so that's, that's the scaling method Ethereum is going to adopt. Um, and so, you know, we see this as a really kind of pivotal thing for Ethereum, and this will, you know, push Ethereum into being a platform that's capable of scaling to, you know, millions and millions of users and thousands and thousands of transactions. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, one other thing uh, just to mention, so um, a lot of focus in Ethereum is on what's happening in the grassroots side. 
Um, but also on the kind of more corporate side, uh, there's a thing called the baseline protocol, um, which I'm on a steering committee or the, the steering committee for. Um, and the baseline protocol is, is really trying to help Ethereum get into large enterprises. Um, and the way it does that is, is it, it basically um, helps connect different company databases to each other using Ethereum as the base layer. So maybe one company is using Oracle, another company is using Microsoft, another company is using SAP. Well, now all of those separate databases can use Ethereum to talk to each other and align on what's happening. So that could be between like a supplier and a producer or, or you know, just between kind of any companies looking to, to, in, to interact more on the data layer. And so I think that's, that's very exciting. And some examples, so Coca-Cola has started doing this on, the, on their bottling supply chain. Um, Ernest & Young, Microsoft, uh, a couple of the other big, big players involved in that. Um, so that's Ethereum. Um, Cosmos, um, so as a quick refresher, Cosmos is this platform. Um, it, it calls itself the Internet of Blockchains. So what it does, it enables people to build their own blockchains very, very easily. And these blockchains built using the Cosmos SDK can all communicate with each other. Um, and, and what's been great to see is since Cosmos launched uh, its main net last year, some very big players have started building on Cosmos. Um, in particular, um, so Binance is, is the largest exchange in the ecosystem. They've built their Binance DEX using the Cosmos SDK. Um, and so, you know, so Cosmos is growing and, and there's you know, a lot of big projects coming to it. Um, they're about to have a, another big upgrade themselves, um, which is uh, that they have this thing called the Stargate testnet that came out at the end of last month, which is enabling the communication between blockchains. So at the moment on Cosmos, you can build blockchains very easily, but the communication layer between them hasn't been switched on. Um, but, but this testnet's currently live and that communication will be turned on very shortly. So that will bring Cosmos to kind of full functionality, which is very exciting. Um, just uh, looking at a few of our other projects. Um, so Hedera Hashgraph, um, this is an inter interesting project, project in that it's more of a kind of enterprise focused blockchain platform. Uh, so it, in particular, it has this thing called its governance council. Um, where it's growing that council to 40 members. Uh, already on the council, it has the likes of Google, IBM, Boeing, Deutsche Telekom, you know, so a lot of really big blue chip companies. And, and these companies, you know, we foresee, you know, we, you know, having spoken to the team, we know that you know, these companies are looking to build on top of Hashgraph. Um, and so we're kind of ex excited to see these kind of new applications coming out from these big companies. Um, and looking ahead, um, we know that there are some more kind of significant large enterprises coming on board in particular you know one of the largest technology companies in the world will be joining the governance council very soon um looking at uh, next so, so solana so, so martin already mentioned solana as being this team um with a with an excellent kind of engineering uh, group of individuals uh, we're really excited about what solana is doing um, the, the, the team, you know, comes from you know, the, the, the head of compression at Dropbox um, was, is the founder of Solana. And the team has come from places like Qualcomm and Google, super, super um, impressive team. And they've made a very, very high throughput blockchain. So they're today achieving over 50,000 transactions a second. If you compare that with Ethereum, Ethereum currently manages 14. So it's an extremely different uh, kind of quantity of transactions. Um, and you know, they're really in a class of their own um, on the kind of throughput layer. And in the last couple of weeks, uh, there was an announcement by a company called FTX, which is a, a very big exchange based in Hong Kong, who have announced that they've been building their decentralized exchange on top of Solana. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, the other thing, you know, Solana, as well as looking at the DeFi space and, and the grassroots space, they're also looking at kind of the real world. And in particular, um, their platform is very well attuned to, to, to helping mobile operators. Um, so one of the, the challenges that mobile operators have actually is accounting for all the packets of data that are continually going through their systems. And in particular, accounting for them between operators. So maybe you know, one mobile carrier needs to communicate with another carrier because they're providing data to one of their users. Um, and Solana is a very good system for doing this because it's basically a, a very high frequency accounting system. Um, so they're already working with a, a big mobile operator in the United States, um, and we've actually been making introductions uh, in Hong Kong uh, to HK Telecom and, and a few other mobile operators um, that we're close with um, and that are actually LPs of ours. Um, so that's, that's very exciting. Just finishing off here, so Terra. Uh, Terra is this project uh, out of South Korea um, that, that is a stablecoin project. 
And what's really exciting to me about Terra is it already has um, 1.8 million users, so nearly 2 million users in Korea. And almost all of those users have no idea that they're using a blockchain platform. Uh, so what, what Terra is, is, is um, it has this app called Chai, which is a lot like PayPal or Venmo. Um, and it's a, it's a way for people to pay for things. And in particular, they've integrated with a lot of e-commerce platforms in South Korea. Um, and so for, for its users, you know, someone using the, the, the Chai app will get slightly cheaper prices on when they're buying things through these e-commerce platforms because Terra itself is, is, has, is charging much lower fee uh, to the e-commerce platforms that it's working with. Um, so I think you know, most e-commerce platforms have to pay about 3% to its payment provider, whereas Terra is charging half a percent. And it can do that because of the, 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 because of the technology underpinning it. So that's really exciting. Um, looking ahead for Terra, they're, they're currently very focused on South Korea, but they're now going to be expanding into um, other markets in Southeast Asia. And um, so, you know, we're very excited about that. We think there's a lot of potential for Terra to, to grow very significantly. And again, like I said, to me, this is like really the, the whole point of this of blockchain technology is to be something that's hidden. It's in the background. It's kind of this backend technology that's very powerful, but that ideally users don't really have to understand or get to grips with. Um, so now moving away from our portfolios and, and maybe looking a bit more at the market and particularly the infrastructure of the market, um, I think it's quite useful to, to kind of understand that, that trading infrastructure is evolving a lot. And this kind of ties in with, with how this space is kind of becoming more institutional. Um, so what you can see here is on the, on the left hand chart, um, this is the amount of, of money that's gone into um, investing into in institutional infrastructure. So in the last three years, we've had nearly a billion dollars of investment going into new companies that are, um, that are serving clients who are institutional. And in particular, we've seen a massive increase in the number of derivatives products and custody products. Um, so to give you, you know, one specific example is, so our Liberty Bitcoin Fund, um, which, which you, you will have heard about through, you know, through our um, kind of emails, you know, this is a product that is very institutional. We have a, a custodian called OSL Custody, they themselves are backed by Fidelity, um, so obviously, you know, very, um, you know, a very kind of significant player. Um, and because of that, you know, we, you know, this our Liberty Bitcoin fund, all the Bitcoin in it is insured. Um, and so, you know, we we have this, you know, high end custodian. We have insurance, um, you know, and the Liberty Bitcoin fund is a very easy way for institutional investors to invest into Bitcoin. You know, that it's a it's a regulated mutual fund based in the Cayman Islands. You know, you get um, regular NAV statements. It, it, you know, it's a very kind of institutional product, but that's only really possible in the last year or so because of these new products coming to the market. And what we're seeing is, you know, back on that earlier slide, as Martin pointed out, volumes have just been growing rapidly in the space. And it's to a large degree because of these new products making it easier for institutional investors to enter the space. Um, uh, so, you know, here we're just looking at, at, at Bitcoin's volume. Uh, so this is Bitcoin's daily volume. Um, so bear in mind, derivatives markets really have only come around in the last kind of six months or so. Um, if, you, if you look at the structure of, of Bitcoin's market, um, it, you know, it trades, Bitcoin trades 24 hours a day. It's, it's very similar to kind of a, a Forex market. Um, and you have these spot markets of, of Bitcoin to fiat and you have spot markets of, of Bitcoin to kind of stable coins and other crypto assets. And now you have these derivatives products. And what we've seen is this just absolute explosion in people using the derivatives products, mainly because um, you know, it's, it's easier for institutional companies to kind of manage their risk. There's now so much more liquidity. It kind of liquidity begets liquidity. More and more uh, institutional actors are more comfortable using kind of futures products and other derivatives. Um, and, and if you just look purely at the growth of, of Bitcoin trading volumes, so in uh, 2013, Bitcoin was only trading, you know, a million dollars a day. And then in 2017, it was trading a hundred million dollars a day, you know, and it's now trading about $20 billion a day. And, you know, this is growth of 190 times in three years. Um, and so, you know, if this growth rate of Bitcoin is to persist, then in four years time, you know, Bitcoin's daily uh, spot markets will exceed the volume of all U.S. equities. Um, I'm not suggesting that that is going to happen, but, but that's just, you know, to, to give you some sense of how rapidly this space is growing um, and how significantly kind of trade volumes are, are increasing. 